Okay, I'm going to begin. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and some new ones. Um, first of all, welcome to everyone. Thank you for taking time to join us today. If you're unfamiliar with our Saturday presentations, we normally try to contain them within an hour. Uh, the speaker generally uses voice. We have been doing some backups. You, you see a, a, a Zoom link there in case uh, we, we generally only use those, first of all, in case there's a technical problem that the Zoom works in real well. And if we have griefers and such like that, cross your fingers or whatever you do in your culture uh, to hopefully that they won't show up. And um, you're more than welcome to chat at any time. Okay. Actually, I prefer a lively conversation that way. I know you're out there and that, uh, <laughs> and that what I'm saying uh, strikes home and including questions in chat and I'll be, try to address them when I can. And you're also free to ask, answer questions in chat and point out links and information and anything else that will uh, help you. Well, I've been, yeah, I've been playing with it for a while and I kind of like the format here, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, one thing, okay, the last time we presented on the top pandemic was April 1st, uh, that nine months ago. And at that time, we were alarmed that uh, the world had reached 1 million confirmed cases. Sadly, nine months later, uh, the known number of cases in the world is 90 million, with 2 million dead and no end in sight. Uh, if you'd like to see details, uh, here's a site with the John Hopkins uh, Medical that I usually take a look at for details. Yeah, and the problem is, is it's not something that looks like it's going away anytime soon. Um, that, that's the most concerning for a lot of people, medical in particular. Okay, so um, as we did, well, let me back up just a second here. Okay, as we did last April, we're going to divide our presentation into two parts, actually three. But this week, I'll talk with you about the human experience associated with the pandemic. Next week, Dr. Robert Hendricks will talk to you about the medical side. That is what we learned about the virus, how it and other diseases affect us. And then we're going to try something a little different. On the 23rd, the week after that, we're going to um, have what we call a fireside chat. That is, since this is such an important topic right now to a lot of people, is that we want to hear from you. In other words, instead of a presentation, we want to focus on the audience concerns and questions, and we'll try to address them and anyone else in the audience who is an um, expert or just wants to talk about what's going on in their area. Yeah, uh, the 23rd, in other words, two, Sundays from now. Next Sunday, Dr. Robert Hendricks will talk about the medical side. Yeah, excellent. Good. I was hoping uh, via the vaccines as well, because there's a lot of questions about uh, them. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do today is um, uh, over the last year, uh, it, or in particular the last nine months, I've been saving thousands of links and articles on the pandemic. And when I started looking at them, I just felt overwhelmed. I think that's kind of the general feeling about this whole thing. Looked overwhelmed at the list and, and as I was preparing to talk to you again. And so what I did what researchers do when they're confronted by a mountain of data that's not easily quantified, I look for themes. And one of the things that I most love about the science circle and, and Second Life in general is incredible diversity of people and places represented and what I can learn from all of you. So what I would ask you today is to please let me know if there are themes that I've missed. I, I could easily have missed major things or if there's important things happening where you live, please share them. Uh, so that your question, let's see. Uh, well, <laughs> I can't address particular cities. Um, I can I can address what's going on around here and stuff, and and it 
it's amazing what's going on in the world. But you can look it up there. You, you know, go take a take a look at Cleveland there or any other place you'd like. Uh, or they, like I said, or things happening uh, where you live. This is a global issue, and understanding the global perspective. Oh, okay. It, it's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> um, global issue and understanding of global perspective is important to all of us. So today I'm going to discuss three aspects of the pandemic, namely what I call dichotomies. In other words, paradoxes of choice, this or that, which sometimes isn't, um, you don't have a good choice. Information, or in some cases, disinformation. In other words, communication has gone viral. And what I kind of kiddingly uh, call divination, in other words, past, present, future, uh, uh, pandemic and context, where we're going next and stuff, which really would be uh, divination. So let's take a look. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is what uh, is dichotomies. Um, the first one is, uh, if we want to take, take a look at this from a scientific standpoint, is how do people react to a threat? Well, uh, that depends on two things generally. Now, that's kind of a busy slide, and these things will be back up on our on the Science Circle website. So, if you don't see the whole thing, this is from you can see the link to the bottom there uh, where this came from. And generally, we take a look at a threat and we go, "Okay, is this high risk or is it kind of low to medium?" And then, is the threat in our head? Or is the threat actually physically right there? Okay, well, unfortunately for the pandemic, it's all of that. In other words, uh, for some people, it is a high risk. Other people believe it's low to medium. Uh, for some people, it's more of a threat in their head. And other people, it's an actual real physical threat uh, that, that's very present. Um, and yeah, it depends on, yeah. Um, as Tagline mentions, uh, please, there's a lot of good stuff going on in chat, so please take a look at that. And so what do we generally do? Well, animals generally tend to either fight, freeze, or take flight. And we can do the same thing, except that, uh, for example, um, we could try to negotiate. Well, it's kind of hard to negotiate with a virus, but we can kind of negotiate with other people as far as what uh, to do or not do. Uh, we can verbally confront. Uh, that may work in some instances, but uh, as you can see, it's not a great idea. And in a lot of cases, contact authority well or look to authority. And then, yeah, scoot or shoot, huh? Yeah, unfortunately, it depends on what country you're in. And you can hide, flee. In other words, there's lots of responses. So let's see what some of the responses that people have done for this particular threat. One that I think is really important, and you can see the differences in countries, is, and pollute. Okay, you can see the difference in countries is whether they're in psychological uh, parlance, so to speak, whether it's a, they think more toward the collective or toward individualism. Uh, in the country in which I live. Uh, I'm not talking that the whole country is homogeneous, but in general, the United States has the highest degree of individualism or thinking about the individual above the community of anywhere in the world. Whereas there's a lot of countries where their first thought is toward the community and their own sacrifice rather than to, uh, yeah, uh, rather than families. In other words, the family and the community comes first. So if the community is doing something or family doing something, then they're te they tend then to agree with it, regardless of their own personal rights or whatever um, they think. Now, on the other hand, it's important to realize that a pandemic is created by people. In other words, it's transmitted every single time from person to person. And in some cases, uh, as I have, if anybody recognizes where the quote on the bottom <laughs> goes, is in other words, the needs of the many may outweigh the needs of the few or the one, um, this is a problem. So we have to, yes, uh, exactly. So we have to spot Star Trek, that sort of thing. So you have to kind of think of 
whether you're looking out for your own interests or looking out for the interests of the community. So that's one of the dichotomies, one of the decisions that we have to know or that we have to uh, decide on. Another uh, dichotomy, another thing that we're faced with is action or inactions. Uh, for example, I read uh, recently that uh, there's a city of 11 million in China where they had uh, 100 new cases and they cordoned off the whole city. In other words, they blocked all the entrance exits, uh, shut down transportation and such. And um, in our, excuse me, in the United States where I live, it they seem sometimes reluctant to, you know, stop mobs uh, from overrunning the capital. Uh, and, and they still, even though we have the most amount of cases of deaths, uh, that, you know, there's still just suggestions about wearing masks and such. And so um, there's a vast difference in the way that uh, we have looked at the pandemic, uh, depending on where you live in the world. The other thing is, frankly, it depends on where you are in that nation. I'll show you a little bit later, that for the United States at least, uh, the differences in the United States about how the pandemic is perceived and, and acted on. So some countries have implemented a nationwide plan, whereas some countries or administrations have kind of just um, reneged on their responsibility and handed over and basically to local regions to do uh, the way that they see fit. Okay, so another dichotomy here. Here again, what I'd like you to do is if I leave something out, I've got a number of these, but if I leave something out, please let me know like, wow, you forgot this, okay? I won't feel at all hurt that you do that. I wanna know because you, uh, the people, we have a really good audience right here and people from all over the world. So if I've left something out, let me know. Now, part of it is also the difference between statistics versus the truth. Uh, just a second. What I mean by that is it's not a matter of not reporting, but in some cases, what you get to report is not always the full story. In other words, first of all, statistics have to be authorized. Nobody really wants to report negative news. Uh, there have been countries, which I won't name, um, that basically said, you will not talk about the pandemic. And so we didn't get some statistics from certain countries for a long time. Um, it's also got to be coordinated. In other words, if you get harsh part of the truth, well, you can report on that. Yeah, well, no, that's another point. Is it, it, it does improve ratings if that's your aim. It, it's also, if you kind of go by quasi-conspiracy theories, reporting more than um, the actual may get you more money and PPs and, you know, in other words, but that's what I mean by statistics versus the truth. It also, as we know in statistics, it has to be representative. In other words, you have to be reporting as a whole uh, rather than just particular areas. It also has to be reported. And in some cases uh, in the United States, they basically said, oh, you don't have to report this anymore. Uh, and then it has to be analyzed correctly and then publicized. It's, it's fine to have an internal document, but if it's not made public, particularly if the public needs to see it, the information to make informed choices. Uh, so in other words, the whole idea, the whole, the best reporting system can also be so-called defeated by those who simply don't like the numbers. In other words, great, you got this big system, but it's like, well, I don't really believe that, so therefore, whatever. So the numbers we generally have reflect a minimum. So when I say there's 90 million cases, well, that's what's officially reported. But at points in this pandemic in the United States, um, people have basically said, well, great, this is how many we have officially reported, but it might actually be 10 times that. So 90 million, we could have 90 million cases just in the United States. And there's a lot of medical folks that would probably say, yep, that's pretty much what you have. Uh, perhaps Dr. Hendricks will touch on that the next week. Okay, the other thing, and this, is, this can be a little controversial, but the other thing is it depends on what country 
and your immunization level and such like that. In the US, in particular, uh, different places here, um, we tend to basically try to clean our houses and not uh, you know, go from one box, our house, to another box, the car, to another box at work, and not be too, uh, unless you're a gardener, <laughs> you know, like I am. Uh, essentially, I get into the garden, and I think my, uh, here again, knock on wood, so to speak, but I think my immunity level is pretty high because there are thousands of path possible pathogens that are in soil and in the air, and we've got like three dogs and a cat, and I'm out in the garden all the time and such. So I actually think that's healthier than uh, leading a, a very sterile um, existence. The other thing as a teacher with a lot of students from lots of countries, I think I've probably been exposed to just about anything. Um, so <laughs> that's actually a bonus. And for people that actually live and work in nature or where disease is more prominent and populations are younger, and tested by disease, their immune system uh, may be um, higher than people in some developed countries that also have comorbidities uh, like diabetes and obesity and such. And there again, uh, take a look at the taglines uh, read in there. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let me continue because we want to here again, uh, these are things that you might want to come back next week and on the 23rd to talk about. Now, the other thing, unfortunately, is seeing is believing. When I was young, just about everybody got, got chicken pox, mumps, measles. I actually have a tiny little scar on my forehead, which is probably, uh, uh, you can't see it because of the wrinkles, <laughs> from uh, chicken pox when I was young. And moms used to kind of have parties where they'd bring their kids and everybody would get chicken pox or mumble, uh, mumbles, uh, mumps or measles all at the same time because they were so contagious. And I will talk about that uh, in a bit about the uh, R0 value, uh, the reproductive, the repro well, reproductivity rate, that sort of thing. Um, you did? Oh, just kidding. Okay. But when, when you had major epidemics or pandemics like smallpox and bubonic plague, it was obvious. Uh, it's not so obvious with COVID. You kind of have to, without seeing, some people don't believe. There's a lot of people that, uh, because it's kind of an internal thing and you don't have a, a, something that you can see on the outside, they, they kind of have to believe someone that, yes, indeed, it, it's there. Wear a mask. Okay. Okay, there's also the, here again, what I'm doing is kind of looking at themes that you can see in the, um, in articles in the news and such, in the media. So there's also kind of the them that the us. You can have, you can have people working millions of hours and hundreds of thousands of people and thousands of doctorates and that sort of thing. But for some people that might, their cousin Vinny, who has a friend who ran something on Facebook last summer, may take precedence over um, that mountain of uh, expertise. <laughs> so who are you going to believe? And that's not always a foregone conclusion that you're going to believe all of the experts and such like that or, or whatever, particularly if there's a lot of disinformation about the validity of what they say and things in the media and such like that. Yeah, my, yeah, me, I, I said such and such there. <laughs> but, the, but the idea is to look at, uh, to weigh this yourself and, and to uh, err on the side of caution during the epidemic or the pandemic, at least that's what I recommend. Okay, so let's take a look then uh, at the next one is basically, um, okay. <laughs> Actually, they might be the, the, the ones I least believe, but that's just my opinion. Okay, simplicity versus deluge. In other words, some of the things that you need to do personally or that I would recommend, although you can, is a very simple, and we'll get to that in a minute. But people are confused, just as I was with all the articles and uh, things I've been collecting. 
uh, people have been very confused by a deluge of sometimes conflicting advice or advice that changes because this is a novel experience for us. And one month they might say one thing and another, and it's not necessarily, just like science when it changes, it's not necessarily contradictory if you look at why they are saying it under the circumstances. But if you don't, you could just have people go, well, you said back in March about this on mass, and now in June you're saying this, and, and that can lead to people not believing. Um, but here again, it, a lot of it is fairly simple, and we'll get to that in a minute. The other thing is about experts Um, well, Shiloh, that's a very good question, but can you, uh, if, you, if it's possible to come next Saturday, is Dr. Hendricks is going to talk about that. I'm deliberately kind of avoiding the medical technical parts uh, of this because uh, that's going to be his um, time to talk about vaccines and the, and the virus and how it affects people and such like that. That's a lot of information. Okay, so there's also experts versus authorities. Is that basically, who do you believe? Is it the politicians or is it the doctors or who do you believe? And so you have legitimate people who uh, are revered by their peers and such, but you can also have people who basically have no experience uh, or mavericks uh, that essentially, you know, wearing a white coat. Well, it, Think of it as immediately suspect. If somebody's wearing a white coat, they have no name tag, there's no association with anyone. Uh, I can get a white coat anywhere, okay, and call myself a, a doctor. In fact, I'm very careful on an airplane or something to make sure that, um, that yeah, well, that's a good question about whether the World Health Organization and such. I tend to believe the World Health Organization over media. Uh, however, you want to talk, uh, you might want to ask Dr. Hendricks about that. Here again, that's more of a medical question. But um, so these are, here again, these are uh, some of the types of dichotomies or decisions that go into why this is a uh, pandemic. Okay, there's also the, here again, I was talking about collective, uh, I was talking about collective versus individualism. Well, part of it is needs versus wants. And sometimes there is no good choice. Every choice you make has a significant cost to it. So for a lot of people, for a lot of people, um, they need to go to work in order to pay bills. They, they in, in a lot of cases, you see, you hearing a lot about whether students should go to school or not. Um, in order to pay for rent, to eat, to get education or not to miss it, in order to be competitive, all of those sorts of things. Um, and at the same time, you can also recognize the need to stay home, to isolate, all of that. So in some cases, some of these dichotomies are not easy decisions. There's also, frankly, some personal items. Like, for example, uh, I know some people, hey, that uh, the pandemic hasn't affected them much at all because they don't tend to be out the ones partying at the crowds and family and all that. Uh, yeah, and frankly, I wouldn't go to, uh, I haven't gone to a restaurant since um, March. I do takeout um, or the lines and stuff where you could pick up, uh, those sorts of things. Rest, but I will talk about that in a second as to why I decided not to do that. So, um, people will also, isolation is more natural to, uh, or more difficult for some people. It tends to possibly lead to depression and, uh, it's really difficult, uh, particularly if you're talking about family or others or friends and such like that. Okay. So, well, now if you don't eat food prepared by other people, what about, um, uh, groceries? So, for example, uh, since March, I've been doing, at our grocery, we, they have curbside service. So, basically, we, we do uh, order, and then uh, they put it in the back of my car, and um, I don't have to go in the store, except for when, I have, when it's absolutely necessary. In other words, I'm treating this like a pandemic, and uh, being close to, close, a lot 
well, being close to 70 and such, I'm not going to fool around with this, okay? So in any case, now the other thing is, is here's another legitimate one where it's difficult to make decisions, is patents versus pandemic. We've heard this before, but you know, companies spend a lot of time and effort to develop vaccines and drugs, and they want to recoup their investments. Uh, they are a company. It's not just totally altruistic. On the other hand, you know, vaccines may bring in, uh, an end to the international emergencies if controls uh, or prices are relaxed or they're uh, subsidized or whatever. So that's, that's a real decision on the parts of companies and governments as to um, how they uh, handle the vaccine. Uh, Dr. Hendricks may talk a little bit more about that. The other thing is we tend to, or, or not we, but people who want to downplay it tend to go, well, there haven't been that many deaths. Uh, you know, so they talk about, well, uh, you know, not that many people have died. But on the other hand, uh, we have learned, and Dr. Hendricks, I'm sure we'll talk about this, is that this is not just a cold, okay? Uh, this can, has, uh, there, there are possible uh, brain effects, uh, permanent disabilities, certainly financial disability. In the United States, go, if you end up going to the hospital, with COVID, the the normal hospitalization cost in the United States is seventy five thousand dollars. If that if, and and you're going to be paying part of that regardless of the uh, insurance, unless you have some really good way of paying it. But for people that don't have insurance or can't afford it, they either decide to uh, possibly stay at home and die, or go to the hospital and have an enormous uh, bill. And so it's not just death that we're talking about here. It's disability and financial and um, physical. Okay. Now, the other thing, whoops, did I go? I, I may have uh, gone backwards here. Hang on a second. Okay. And then the other one. One of the other dichotomies there is kind of the known versus the unknown. In other words, if we kind of had a, uh, a time that went, okay, uh, this is just like other, yeah, uh, tell me about it. Uh, my um, uh, stepdaughter is an ER nurse. She's a very good one. But boy, she um, has been, thank you, uh, Cass. And these will be available on our, on our site. And if you want to see them again, or partly of these, and Dr. Hendricks ones on the 23rd will be available for those too. And so, yeah, uh, absolutely. In other words, for every person that's hospitalized with COVID, there are people with, that are pregnant or diabetes or heart attacks or strokes or whatever that, um, in other words, the normal uh, medical crowd. There are places in Los Angeles right now, unfortunately, hospitals that are having to decide and actually do a triage thing. In other words, this person is not sick enough to be even admitted. Uh, and that's a real sad situation. In fact, that's the, um, the curve that I'll remind people again that we're trying to avoid. Because essentially, if you, if you don't have modern medicine, then you're back 100 years ago with the 1918 flu epidemic. And uh, then we're in real trouble, okay? So we want to try to avoid uh, that situation at all costs, but we're just not getting there. Okay, so what are some reactions to all this? And here again, those are the themes I found, but what are some reactions that people have had? And so if, you, if I'm missing some themes, please feel free to put them in chat. I may very well have missed something that's important that you've seen and that I may just have missed. I've been watching, um, of course, I've been watching the chat here and people talk about this and that and media and say, things like that. But if there's actual, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, and everybody does that. In other words, uh, the first thing that happens, whether it's a hurricane where I live or um, earthquake perhaps, or you know whatever, is panic. And in some cases, it's irrational panic, like hoarding toilet paper, or in some cases, blaming others immediately. Stages of grief. There, there you go. Or focus. In other words, it, 
in some cases it can be actually constructive. In other words, you start to focus and you go, how was I living before now? Can, couldn't I live with less this or stress or uh, should I focus more on family and groups and friends and such like that? But the focus has tended to be, <laughs> uh, I won't touch that. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, has been on, tends to be self family, small social groups and such like that, which, as I said, can be either socially constructive or destructive. Uh, authority, our deference toward political figures, and not just political figures, but other uh, figures that we hold in authority. In other words, tell me what to think. Um, miracles, you know, deference to supreme beings. I've seen a huge jump in Facebook on uh, religious content or escape. I've also seen in Facebook um, about binging on movies or alcohol or simply disregarding uh, the, what's going on in the world. In a, but some people have actually uh, started to go, wow, you know, I could learn to cook or learn to garden. Or business is going, well, we don't want to go under, so how can we do that? Well, more takeout, more curbside, more other ways to stay in business. And then, of course, the resignation. Now, what I mean by resignation is not just giving up, but sometimes you resign to go, okay, this is not going away tomorrow. Uh, yes, I can catch it. Yes, I can give it to other people, so I'm going to do what I need to do. And no, that's not a lot of fun, but I'm going to do it because I'm a responsible citizen of the world or however way you need to convince yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's another uh, <laughs> topic there with survivalists and such like that. Okay. Um, but if you're a survivalist, you first have to agree that, hey, there, there is a pandemic. Okay, let's take it again uh, about the second part of this is the uh, disinformation. Now, I'm actually going to give you some information, but as I said, it's only the statistics that are available. In some cases, it may be a power of 10 off. Um, so let's take a look. Well, first of all, you have to look at the difference between science and conspiracy. In science, we might go, okay, there's good evidence to show that wearing a mask reduces the virus when you exhale or inhale. And that less virus, and then so the understanding then from that is that less virus means your body has to fight less virus. So wearing a mask around others protects you and them. Okay, now, your conspiracy theory, you jump straight from there's a virus to, and this is, this is a combination of two real conspiracy theories, one of which I've read and one which people, actually two people told me last week. It is a man-made. Its purpose is to get me vaccinated, so there's a microchip. And so it could be controlled by Elon Musk satellites, and then I'll hand over my money and guns to Satan-worshipping pedophile elites. And yes, those are real. I didn't make those up. That's a combination of two uh, conspiracy theories going on. Yeah, I would tend to believe that maybe it's the aliens, you know, or whatever. And I don't mean the ones walking over the border. I mean the ones in the spaceships. Okay, but let's take a look in seriousness uh, about, well, yes, but if you look at the deleting the Twitter accounts, the first thing that... Uh, he, shoo, he who shall go unnamed is going to try to do is to try to jump to something else and then to make up their own. And in other words, it's really difficult to quell um, conspiracy theories or ideas in general. So if you take a look at actually the scientific behind conspiracy theories, let me show you where I got this one. This is an article that I saw uh, this morning. And uh, let's see. And it actually says why we have um, uh, the scientific uh, social psychologist view behind conspiracy theories. And one is, as somebody mentioned the World Health Organization, is they see this as kind of an infodemic. In other words, I like that word. And essentially that there's a deluge of data out there, all combined with falsehoods. In other words, unless you are an expert in the area or a critical thinker. Um, yeah, I know, the 5G one. Uh, I, I actually was going to put that up here, but the idea that 
uh, that's my neighborhood, by the way. That's where I am um, in, in technology. Um, that's where my expertise is in. But the idea that 5G causes COVID, oh my goodness, you know. But basically the article says, if you read through the article, it basically says that we tend to like misinformation unless you're a critical thinker uh, because it's simple. It's causal. There's an unseen enemy, uh, and then it's easy to explain, particularly when you are scared or have legitimate concerns over unemployment, social injustice, contentious election, feeling disenfranchisement, um, all of that. So you tend to come up with a conspiracy theory that puts a square blame. Uh, it helps you feel like you're in control because now you understand how things work. Um, the more someone repeats something, our brain often mistakes familiarity with truth, and we tend to blame others for uh, our failure, and then we look to a savior to protect our in-group. That's part of the article. It's very good. Now, if you want a little more levity here, I would recommend, has anyone uh, seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail movie? Yeah. <laughs> It's a classic, okay. And there's a three minute, uh, I put a link up there for the three minute uh, witch trial scene and the kind of way that they not so logically uh, find out whether someone's a witch. Um, yeah, we need a shrubbery. Okay, um, but it's a very interesting scene, but unfortunately it's, it's kind of real. Yeah, exactly. Spanish Inquisition, et cetera, et cetera. So, so if you want a break, take a look at that uh, link there. Okay, let's take a look then at the next piece of information I have. Okay, so there is also the situation with uh, preparation versus actually implementation. In other words, the best plans of mice and men off go astray, right? Okay. So this is real too. I, I'd like to give you, a, a, I can give you a link to this later. But medical agencies, I mean, if you've been following this over the thing, they knew that the pandemic was uh, inevitable. There's been other SARS viruses with MERS and uh, SARS-1 out there. Yeah, uh, uh, Steinbeck, uh, exactly. That's a quote from Steinbeck. Um, and they knew it was inevitable. And particularly since you had an H1, uh, H1N1 flu and then Ebola all within this decade, is that agencies sat down and they, they did simulations and they worked through them just like the military does with communications and simulations and train core teams um, to handle things, just like in the United States for Department of Homeland Security and hurricanes and such. And so they had an entire guide uh, for all of this. And the scary thing is, is that if you actually read through the guide, it was for 2025, but it was very, very similar to exactly what we're experiencing today. Unfortunately, uh, the best guides, if they're not read or dismissed, uh, are worthless. So basically by 2020, within three years, um, the powers that be, who shall go unnamed, uh, basically dismissed staff, uh, gutted funding, ignored the guidance, and then claimed that they knew nothing about a pandemic. <sighs> oh well, okay. And then started, and then gave contra contradictory guidance and false statements, stuff like that. Yeah, okay. So, in any case, let's go. Let's go ahead. I want to try to keep this to an hour. This is as of this week the share of the population reported with COVID. Now, if you look, it, it varies tremendously from countries who have this under control, the ones in yellow, et cetera, or that um, just have not spread it as much. In other words, in some cases, yeah, I know. So in the United States, for example, one in 16 people, in some cases, a lot higher than that. In other words, in some cases, one in four uh, people have it or are known to have it, which means probably minimum numbers. Um, and it varies depending on what countries and how much travel you have and how much reporting there is and such like that as to where. Now, this is the share of the population reported with it. This is the cases per day 
um, basically. In other words, in the United States right now, there's 200,000 people per day. Um, this is the cases per day per 100,000 population. Or as I uh, told a friend of mine uh, the other day, there's more people that are dying of COVID in the United States every day than died in the 9-11 tragedy, that sort of thing. And Tagline wrote something in, in all caps there. So, uh, yeah, take a look. Well, it is appalling, uh, but these are, these are the figures. And then this is an interesting one. It's a little crowded, but essentially this is the number of uh, deaths versus case, uh, cases. This was back in August. But you can see it, it varies tremendously depending on where you are in the world and what kind of government you have and uh, how much control they have the population and how uh, people feel about either individuals or collect collectivism. You can see in the one down there on the bottom right that a lot of countries that are in uh, Asia Oceania area they're uh, were able to control this uh, fairly uh, quickly on whereas other countries it's it's almost totally out of control yeah ca -ca -ca. Um, okay and now just real quick I, I don't want to harp on the US but uh, there's a little bit of difference uh, in in uh, when you look at the U.S., in other words, you can't just say the U.S. Um, you have to look at different areas. So, for example, if you look at the total cases, you'll see that they're pretty much where there are either uh, very high density populations or there are a lot of uh, elderly people or such like that. But then if you looked at actually the confirmed cases per capita, it's a little different picture. And unfortunately, just like back in the um, 1500s and such, when First Nations, the Native peoples, um, got infected, is that uh, they didn't have a kind of genetic immunity. So in, in the United States, uh, uh, Native Americans are being really, really hard hit uh, by the virus, the same way they did with other um, things that started in, in, in Europe and other places. And then the other thing that you'll see there is the confirmed cases per capita are the highest ones are not in the cities. They're in the areas where people tend not to wear masks and don't believe in the virus. And those are the areas that are circled up there. Okay. Actually, I was just coughing. I don't know whether it's um, a <laughs> uh, power suggestion or what. Okay, let's keep uh, moving on here is that uh, now the other thing is at the very beginning, there tended to be this thing about this is an old people's disease. Well, it's not. And maybe Dr. Hendrick can back this up next week. But essentially, if you look at the relative number percent of cases, it's uh, people between 20 and 50 or 20 and 55, 20 and 60, not the elderly, however, comma, the, uh, so the most cases are there, and then there's between 35 and 60% of people who are asymptomatic, uh, and then a lot more that are only mild and things, and then, but it's the older people who are really susceptible to this being a severe disease. And I won't say anything more about it right the moment, because I'm, I suspect that Dr. Hendricks is going to talk a bit about this uh, next week. I just thought I'd point out Yes. Now, this is China, South Korea, Spain, and Italy. In other words, uh, this is data from four countries, not just one in there. So let me kind of divide what we may happen or what's next. Uh, this is really treading in, in the thin area here. The first thing that I think is kind of unambiguous, well, and that's, Syzygy, you've got a point. In other words, there's a lot of, a lot of factors here. And even if you looked in a city, if you looked and say we're one, uh, the city near us has a great disparity between wealthy and, and, and poor. And so you, I bet you if you actually looked at who uh, has um, COVID, you'd see a, a, a pretty good uh, correlation there. But one of the things if you look at this 
is, does this look like it's slowing down? <laughs> yes, they are. And a part of the reason I know this is by direct uh, or slightly secondhand, uh, yeah, that's okay. It, it's worth shouting about. Uh, is this, a, the one thing I want to point out too is it's statistics kind of are mean in a way because they talk about populations, not individuals. For individuals, this is life or death or, or people that it's life or death for. I don't think there's a single person in the United States unless they're living in the hills somewhere that doesn't have someone they know that has the disease or possibly has died from it. We're at that stage right now. Okay, and you can tell this is not under control. That line is not going down. That line is going up. And so we don't really know. In other words, is this going to, we can take a look at things in the past, but we don't really know whether this is, uh, how this will be contained. Um, with the positive point, of course, of, of the vaccines, but then Dr. Hendricks will talk about that. So can we learn anything? Well, I had earlier taken a look at the 1918 one, and the 1918 one lasted about two years. The worst cases were during the first year and a half, and it came in waves. However, uh, the and it was mostly a young person. So in other words, uh, the uh, uh, teen to uh, middle-aged uh, people tended to die of it. Well, that's not the case uh, for this virus. And so we tend to be kind of a steady climb with surges. Uh, some people, medical people have been saying, hey, this can last easily through 2021. Uh, it's deadly to older people and immune compromised people. It's infected. Now, on the other hand, in... Uh, no, that's actually, okay, that's actually who died during 1918. That was the inset is basically saying that the younger people died, not the older people. Of course, the, the um, I was watching a, a very good series, by the way, that talks about, um, it's called London Hospital, and it's about how, th in 19, around 1920, and uh, the life expectancy was only about 45 at the time. So, um, you know, we, we live in a little different world. And then watch the, uh, uh, some of the things Tagline's putting in there. Okay, so um, so it is a little different. So it's, it, we, can, we can go, yeah, we, we, we've seen these other uh, pandemics, but um, it, it's hard to say, yes, this will follow the same track or anything else. So uh, I'm not sure about where things are going, except that, of course, we have vaccines, but that's only uh, a lot of the rich countries are, are buying up the vaccines. So in some cases, people are going, well, hey, if you're not a rich country and you don't have priority, you might not get a vaccine until 2023, 2024, uh, something like that. So uh, and possibly Dr. Hendricks will talk about it. Yeah. Um, and they can hoard them. They can buy them up. Uh, such like that. Now, uh, you've also got here now, here again, the, uh, statistics are unfair because they're, people are not numbers. Um, but if you actually look at this in comparison to, say, the history of the world, you will see that the ones now, the, this is not exactly to scale. It's kind of to scale having to do with corporate memory, so to speak. In other words, public memory. So in other words, HIV AIDS on there has been around for 40 years, and there's about 70 million cases uh, uh, compared to 85 million cases already with COVID, but the mortality rate was much higher with HIV AIDS, uh, particularly depending on what part of the world and um, earlier in its um, existence and stuff. So therefore, there, is a much, there were much larger uh, deaths from HIV AIDS. In the case of the 1918 flu, about 500 million people, about one third. Yeah, I like the I like the slide, Tim. Um, that's why <laughs> it's also uh, there is a um, display that I'm going to update after I hear from Dr. Hendricks and stuff in the next couple of weeks. By the 23rd, I hope to have it all updated. It's on uh, the island here, and it's kind of updated as of last April, <laughs> so I'm going to have to update it. Uh, based on all of what we know now. 
Um, but the idea is, and then in, in 1918, there were about 500 million deaths, excuse me, 500 million cases, about a third of the world, which right now, of course, the population is way, way, four or five times what it was then, uh, with a lot of uh, crowded cities and such. But of course, um, we have antibiotics, we have hospitals, we have, we know that, you know, viruses and, and, and airborne transmission stuff is real, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there are also 50 to 100 million deaths. Well, we could, we could easily get into that situation if we simply ignored this whole thing. And that's, of course, what uh, is the um, fear here is if people don't take vaccines, et cetera, like that, that we may end up that. Now, this is the part, and I've got 10 minutes and I can uh, finish this up, is this is the part that individuals should know and keep in touch. Now, Dr. Hendricks will uh, back this up or perhaps add details or even uh, something slightly different. But this is simple, folks. The objective is to limit the amount of virus that gets into your body. Now, the visuals on the right actually come from uh, CDC. But the idea is you keep far enough away from somebody who's infected, and at this point, you have to go, everybody's infected, at least in the United States. You also want to limit the time in enclosed places. Uh, the only time I've ever been in an enclosed place without a mask in since March was I had got my teeth cleaned the other day, and they took extreme measures to um, keep from getting, well, never inhale. Yeah, you could stop breathing. Um, but the idea is if you're going to sit in a restaurant with no masks on and eat, that's really, really nice. But that's an enclosed space <laughs> with a lot of people without masks. That's kind of one of the, the high things. Or, unfortunately, church and, or, unfortunately, other places like that if you're not wearing masks. Um, the other thing is ingesting. You don't want to be touching surfaces and then touch your nose or your mouth or your eyes. So there's lots of, so basically if you can remember those, every place you go, don't pick your nose. Uh, if uh, every place you go is, if you can remember this simple thing is you wanna to try to limit the virus that gets in you, then that's all you really have to remember. You don't have to go, how many feet away should I do for how long, blah, blah, that sort of thing. But if you want those things, then some of the guidelines on the bottom, but uh, uh, here again, I'm sure that Dr. Hendricks will give you a bit more about this, but you can't be too educated about this. Okay, now this is really busy, but the other thing is, the other thing, for example, in our area is that we are just getting into cedar, uh, we're in cedar country, and the little cedars are just ripe to go boom, and you got pollen all over your car and everywhere. So what is the difference between uh, cedar fever, so to speak, and or cold or uh, flu or allergies or whatever? So a good table and uh, like this will give you an idea of what is the difference. One of the things, of course, is uh, what what's the classic? I see a whole bunch of stuff going on in, in chat there. What's one of the classic symptoms of COVID that's not always but it is a kind of a telltale. Thanks, Max. Yeah, here again, this will be available. I can tell you where I got this and such. But in other words, losing, well, now blue lips. By the time you have blue lips, you're in trouble. You should be going to the hospital or getting oxygen. Um, my doctor actually got COVID and he had oxygen at home. So he didn't have to go to the hospital. But, um, but basically the uh, losing taste or smell, for example, is one that's kind of rare in a lot of in a lot of other things. But if you all of a sudden do that, you, you can kind of go, "Whoops!" <laughs> Here again, I, I'm going to try not to step over Dr. Hendricks because, or he will then confirm some of this next time around. But there's some that are really pretty good signs of like you got this versus something else. So here again, what can you do? Well, limit the number of viruses. Now, why do you want to limit the number of viruses? Because essentially, it's like having a gate or a castle. If you have a vaccine, uh, you're essentially going, okay, we're going to have this practice drill where we storm um, the castle. And so, yeah, 
Uh, your body pulls up the drawbridge, okay? Because the vaccine basically, uh, your body sees this thing that looks really like the real thing. It's not, uh, or in some cases, a weakened uh, version. And it's able to go, yay, okay, we're going to build up our defenses. And then when you really see this thing, it's not just a gate that's between you and the hordes, but it's a castle. So it's much easier for your body to um, defend against it. The other thing is, this is the, um, uh, here again, if you want an easy place to see this, you can take a look on, you have the vinyl hordes. Okay, you can look at what's called the uh, reproduction number, or R0, uh, R0, and for different diseases. Now, remember that even though HIV AIDS is deadly, and it has an R value of 2 to 5, it's not transmitted through the air, okay? And a lot of these are not. In other words, sometimes you have to touch people. Uh, in the case of, um, you know, HIV AIDS, it's... Um, um, sexual contact or blood transfusion stuff, um, or even even Ebola, you know, is not even, you know, things that, which are as deadly as that. But uh, here again, I don't want to cover too much of this stuff, but this is a resp, excuse me, this is an airborne thing. Like with measles and mumps, it was so contagious that basically if we didn't have a vaccine, it would be, uh, kids today would have it, okay? Well, we do. Uh, on other, in other cases, like Ebola, hepatitis, uh, some of those sorts of things don't have, uh, the, the reproductivity rate is not as high. Now, a normal flu, the reproductivity rate uh, can be from only like, in other words, if you're sick, they figure that if you don't take precautions that you might transmit it to between one and a half to three people. COVID, particularly with this new strain that came out, that they found that now seems to be going around the world is it really ups the game a little bit as far as the R value. So that essentially COVID is around six or seven, which means that's contagious. Uh, and you can see the chart on the other end, what, what it means to um, uh, uh, have it be that contagious. And so if it's that contagious, we really do need to, unless we want to infect everybody on earth, uh, we really do need to continue to wear masks, social distance, wash your hands, everything that you've heard, okay? Okay, and finally, and this is the only slide that I actually have from the last time that we presented back uh, in April, is why do we want to do this? Well, part of it is that the difference between uh, and this is uh, the last slide here, so I'm going to be finishing up exactly in the hour, is the difference between 1918 and 2020 is the medical side, okay? Um, let's see, what did I write? The 0.1 to 0.25%? Yeah, in other words, if I got it wrong, I'll go back and check on that, but if uh, you got the right figures, let me know. Okay, so the idea here is that if this is not going away, we want to know, we want to have time to know as much about it, uh, to give people accurate information, to not overwhelm the healthcare system like is happening in some areas in the United States right now, where essentially you won't get admitted to a hospital because the beds are full or there aren't enough. It actually, in the United States, the problem is there's not enough medical people. It's not necessarily the beds. But essentially, now this, by flattening the curve, which is something you heard in, for 10 months, by doing that, you're essentially perhaps prolonging things a little bit. But the other times, it's not just, okay, let's infect everybody here, her immunity, and our 50 million people die well. Oh, well, you know, we don't want that because <laughs> every every person who dies is, is a person with a family and other people associated. We don't want to have that legacy. So what can I say? You know, uh, socially, just every time, no matter what, it's just like uh, the military. You know, you can't make a mistake uh, or when you're flying, you don't make a mistake. So, you know, wash your hands. <laughs> don't get near people, don't stay too long in our closed spaces, all of that. So, uh, 
I saw now one one thing about one minute here. I saw um, actually the groceries things like that. See, this is the reason why we're opening things up on the twenty third. There's a lot of great stuff going on in uh, the chat that we want to take a look at. And yes, I am done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you have any if you have any comments and stuff, you've been commenting all the time. But essentially, I'm done. And I appreciate you coming. And please come next week. Please come on the 23rd, if you can, on Saturdays. You'll hear a lot more. This is a very important topic for everybody. Well, good. I'm glad to hear uh, that you uh, thought it was informative. And here again, you can hear you can get side B uh, next time. And if I missed anything, uh, bring it up in, in chat and stuff next time around around the 23rd as far as uh, any major themes I might have missed. Thank you. Yeah. It, I think we're all tired of this. I think we'd like to go back to normal. And in theory, and Dr. Hendricks might uh, uh, expound on this, but you know, if everybody just kind of gritted their teeth. Oh, hey, my dentist, by the way, said that people have been gritting their teeth too much, and you can actually see it in, in teeth. Uh, but if we just kind of figuratively grit our teeth and do what we're supposed to, the whole thing would probably disappear in about a month. I mean, you can see it actually in some countries it's disappeared. And it's not because it just disappeared. It's because people did what they're supposed to do. Yeah, the disinformation part is like what the who the World Health Organization talked about a dis uh, pandemic or dis a dis what it was a dis or info me pandemic. Uh, Okay, well, thank you for coming, and um, uh, feel free to uh, chat among yourself if you want, and I'm going to kind of uh, sign off, and if you are at all able, come next Saturday, the, uh, the Saturday after that. We'd like to hear from everybody, because you may have different experiences where you are. And yes, it can't be said enough uh, to thank Chantal for making all this possible and us here.
She's kind of like the super spreader of good information. <laughs> or, or of people um, being able to come share uh, from all over the world. Um, yes, I keep saying that, yes, they will, but I'm going to try to make them available. In other words, I put them on this slide viewer, which was actually a favorite of mine back in like 2007 or 2008. <laughs> and it has uh, security um, codes in it, so to speak, for, uh, but I will try to put them on something that uh, in, in the pandemic uh, area that we have on, on the island, I'll put some of these slides and other ones we've had and anything from Dr. Hendricks if possible uh, so that people have this available to them. I'll just put it on a different kind of uh, format. Thanks, Arian. 4 a.m., oh my goodness. And of course, that's the goal, to learn something. I mean, the whole purpose of my coming here is to learn stuff from you. <laughs> that's, that's the thing I gain most from teaching, is learning from everyone else. After all, I know what I know, but I don't know what you know. <laughs> 